I invite you to please uh, join me in prayer as we do uh, begin our message today, and let us pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you for your Son, Christ Jesus, for the gift of forgiveness he has given to us. Help us each day to know that we have that corruption of sin, the war that wages within each of us, but also to know your promised forgiveness that comes through Christ Jesus. May we remember this day and every day. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and so it went. It was very good. Most of you, even if you do not uh, subscribe to the six-day creation as, as we teach, you do know the creation story. You know that God created the world very good. He created it wonderfully. And most importantly, He created it without sin. Now, all too quickly, the world fell into sin, didn't it? And while there's quite a bit of scholarship around the creation of the world, there's not so much scholarship as to the actual event of the fall into sin. There's not a great deal of debate as to whether or not Adam and Eve were that cause. In fact, there are some scholars who argue it, but it's far and few between. Adam and Eve, in their pride, wanted to be like God. Their pride manifested. They picked that fruit from the tree to be like God. That first sin that entered the world. Now it's interesting because there is a great deal of debate, however, as to how that sin affected the world. A great deal of debate as to whether or not there is what we call original sin. And don't worry, we'll talk about a little more what original sin is. But that idea, that concept, is what brings us to our heresy that we're going to discuss today. A heresy by the name of Pelagianism. It was started by, or named for, a monk, a British monk, by the name of Pelagius. And let me spell that name for you. Pelagius is P-E-L-A-G-I-U-S. P-E-L-A-G-I-U-S. Now Pelagius, as I mentioned, it's thought that he was a, a, a British monk, although Jerome suggests he might have been Welsh. That same area, though, of the world at the time. And he was in, he was in the 5th century. And he came with this message, uh, well, a message of moral uprightness. He came with this message of human responsibility. And let me give you a little bit of background on what was going on at the time. I don't know if you know your Roman history, but a very important event in Roman history happened in 410 B.C. And I imagine, Chris, as a historian, you're probably familiar with this, but something that hadn't happened in eight, 800 years occurred. In 410, I just, I'm sorry, I said B.C., 410 A.D., was the fall of Rome. For the first time in 800 years, the city of Rome was attacked. It was sacked by the Visigoths. If you don't remember the Visigoths, maybe you remember the Goths or the Huns. Um, you should, because if you have German or Swiss descent, uh, they're your great, 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 long way back ancestors. But they were what were called barbaric tribes. And these tribes were on the move. And back to Pelagius, as a British monk, he had to run for his life. See, much like the current ISIS tribes, ISIS, Islamic State, who do not care for Christians, neither did these barbarians. In fact, by 466 A.D., all of Europe was overcome by these barbaric tribes. More important for us, these tribes were also pagan. These tribes were tribes that did not believe in Christianity. Now, Pelagius, he would have had great opportunity to be exposed to Christianity. I don't know if you knew this, but by already by the 2nd century A.D., Christianity had come to the British Empire. It had spread from, the, from down by Rome all the way up to Britain. And this is significant because of how great the Roman Empire stretched. Now, what had happened, it was not spread up there by Christian missionaries or apostles as often as the, as the rumor but probably by Roman soldiers who brought that message of the gospel as it had affected them. Now Pelagius, as I'd mentioned, he had run for his life. He had fled, and he went down eventually to Palestine. He was looking for Jerome. But Pelagius, as I'd mentioned, he was a monk. And he was what was called an ascetic monk. Maybe you, you're not familiar with that term, ascetic or asceticism. But that term, ascetic, it, it literally, it, it refers to self-discipline. And it's not so surprising if you think about the life of a monk in a monastery. 
Most monks are called to live an ascetic lifestyle. They give up uh, marriage, or they give up rich food, or, or strong drink. And so, too, Pelagius gave up oh, any extras in his life. But he looked at the world around him. And he lived in a world much like our very own. The world around him, even among Christians, was morally bankrupt. It was a world that was full of people who were living licentious lifestyles, who were living in cheap grace. They knew that they were forgiven, so they lived however they wanted. And Pelagius, he responded to this. He responded by saying, no, we are morally responsible. We have a responsibility in the way we live as Christians. Not only what we say or do, but the way we think. The problem is with Pelagius, he took this a step further. And he believed that in our free, in our re responsible living, that we had to have free will. In fact, this carried over into his understanding of sin. He believed that unless you committed a sin, you were not a sinner. So he did not, he rejected what we call original sin today. That sin that is passed on from Adam and Eve. Now we can see how this is fairly attractive. This is fairly rampant in our world today. This idea that we are responsible for our own salvation. That we have played some part. We see how many different Christian doctrines, how they talk about this. This idea that we must have freedom of the will. A freedom to accept Jesus. To surrender to Jesus. That if he knocks, to open the door for him. We see this very prevalent in our world today. But this puts the burden on us. This makes us responsible, partially responsible. Now Pelagius, he took it a step further. And he said we were entirely responsible. We were entirely responsible. So not only, as is taught today by many Christian denominations, not only do we accept Jesus, but then in order to remain in the faith, it is our own good deeds, our own hard works, our own walk. And so you can see why he had no need for original sin. Because he put the responsibility back on us. It was all about our self-discipline. The problem is, is, it's unbiblical. Psalm 51, David says so very clearly, that sin corrupted from the beginning. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. It was not an action by the person that caused David to be sinful. It was the fact that he was born, the fact that he was conceived, the fact that he was born into this world, he was a sinner. Well, just in case that's not clear, Paul picks this up too in the reading that Sue read not long ago from Romans 8. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. And obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Again. The creation was subjected to sin. The trees did not sin. Flowers did not sin. Dogs did not sin. But certainly trees die. Flowers die. Dogs die. For the wages of sin is death. And so we see that it is not merely a matter of the actions of self-discipline. But Scripture teaches us our sinful condition is what makes us sin. It's not whether or not we sin. It's the fact that we are already sinners that causes us to sin. Now Pelagius, though, in order to, to push his idea of the free will, he had to throw out original sin. Because that bumps up right against his teaching that we can discipline ourselves. That we can accept God. And so he brushed it under. But this also affected his view of grace. Because when you stop counting sin as causing death, when you stop looking at sin as, the, as the, our response to God's law, our failures before God's law, you lose sight of God's grace. And this is truly what happened to Pelagius. God's grace was exchanged with what we would do with what we would call today a works righteousness. With this idea that somehow we ourselves can save ourselves. That there is no need for Christ. No need for salvation. 
And this is a great burden. I don't know about you, but when I start to think about that, think about how great that burden is if we were to ex- accept Pelagius' teaching. This idea that we are responsible, that with enough discipline, you yourself can bear the weight of your sins. To me, that's hard to imagine, hard to believe. Pelagius was rejected as a heretic finally in 418 A.D. Remember, he had fled from Britain about 410 or 411 when Rome was being sacked. But 418 was when, in the Council of Carthage, he was called, he was judged a heretic, a false teacher. But this did not stop his teaching. In fact, what came out of his teaching is what we now call semi-Pelagianism. And we won't spend a lot of time because semi-Pelagianism, the main difference is, is that once you accepted Christ, once you accepted the faith, then God would help you along the way. And that's the difference between Pelagianism where it was all about you. Semi-Pelagianism said, as long as you took that first step, then God carried you the rest of the way. Again, it puts the burden truly back on you, though. In 529 A.D., this heresy was rejected. The problem is, is these heresies are anything but ancient, aren't they? The problem is, is we see this rampant in our culture, our Christian culture today. This idea of Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, will not call that by name. Many of those who follow a student of John Calvin by the name of Jacob Arminius. They're called Arminians today. And those Arminians, they believe in this idea of free will, this idea that we are responsible, that we have freedom to choose God. Or freedom not to choose Him. Freedom to reject Him. The problem is, is this is unbiblical. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul addresses this. And before we ever get to our favorite Lutheran verses in 8 and 9, he addresses this in verses 1 through 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, once, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Paul starts it out and he ends that section of text that same way that we were dead in our trespasses. We were not able to do anything to open a door or to make a decision to come down in an altar call. But it was only by the work of the Spirit that makes us alive. It is only by the work of God because that original sin has corrupted each and every one of us. It has polluted us. That sin that was passed on from Adam is one that continues to infect us today. By the way, Pelagius also rejected infant baptism. If there's not original sin, well, there's no need for baptism either, is there? God instead offers us a free gift of grace. Even as hard as it is for us to understand, God offers us this free gift. And I know we've been in Romans 5 quite a bit, but we're going to go back there again this week. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. God's grace is that free gift. That which takes dead sinners and makes them alive is not a decision on our part. It is the work of God in our hearts. We do not have a free will But we, sadly, we have a bound will. There were only three humans in history who had a truly free will. Adam, Eve, and Jesus Christ. After Adam and Eve's fall into sin, we have what is now called a bound will. Luther taught that when he spoke about the will, he talked about it with things above and things below. And let me unpack that a little because sometimes that's harder for us to understand. When we talk about those things above, He's not talking about literally those things which are above our head. But he's talking about things that reflect our relationship with God. 
that uh, whether or not we spend time in God's Word, whether or not we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, whether or not we live as the people of God, those are what Luther termed things above. And those things above, we have a completely bound will. And let me explain to you why he said this. Working from that perspective of Paul, that we are dead in our trespasses, made alive in Christ, he realized that we could only do God's will or we could only do Satan's will. We are not, if we sin, whose will are we doing? I know that's rhetorical, but Satan's will, right? If we sin, that's the will of Satan to break God's law. If we live according to God's will, spend time in his word worshiping together, living with Christian hearts and minds, we are living not by our own power, but by the Holy Spirit. We have a bound will. We either do the will of God or the will of Satan. Luther was a bit more crass. He said that we were like donkeys. He used another word, but he said we were like donkeys. And either Satan was riding us or God was riding us. It brings it into perspective. No direction of our own. Now, he also, though, distinguished that from the things below. And when Luther talked about things below, he was talking about those things in our lives, like uh, whether or not you chose to come into church by Eighth or Holt this morning, whether or not you chose to eat breakfast before you came or didn't, whether you uh, styled your hair one way or another. Those are all things that Luther termed below, things below. And in those things, we have freedom of the will. Yes, Luther believed in the sovereign God. We believe in the sovereignty of God, that he is over all things, that he is in control of all things. But he's also given us unique and wonderful characteristics. He has created us uniquely and wonderfully. So not all of us are going to wear green and not all of us are going to wear blue and not all of us are going to wear purple. But we have freedom in those types of things. But in things above, we have no freedom. Because as you all know, every day there is a war that is battled inside your heart. Every day there is a war against what you know you should do and what you actually do. Paul talks about this in Romans 7. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are by nature sinful and unclean. John says in his first epistle, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John points out a very real truth. If we think we have the ability to take on sin on our own, if we think we have the ability and strength to confront sin in our hearts and lives, we are only lying to God and to ourselves. It is only by the power of Jesus Christ that sin can be confronted. It is only by the power of Jesus Christ that sin can be destroyed in our hearts and our lives. It is only by the power of Jesus Christ that death will be conquered once and for all and that we shall rise with him. It is only by Jesus that we can know true life. For of our own we are dead in our trespasses, but by him we are alive. By him we have been given new life by his death on the cross. And the way that God gives to us life is through his means of grace. Now, I know it's been a little while since you've been in your catechism. So let me remind you what we mean when we say those means of grace. We know that there's one way of salvation through Christ alone, his death on the cross. But we talk about different delivery methods, ways that God gives us his grace. One way we've already done this morning. 
as I stood before you. One of the means of grace is absolution. I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, all the way end to the end, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we receive the Lord's Supper in not too long here. That is another means of God's grace, a means by which He delivers His grace to us. As we receive that body and blood of the Lord Jesus, we believe that it is efficacious, that it works to bring forgiveness in our hearts and lives. But to confront Pelagius' last heresy, at least the last one that we're going to talk about today, we also believe that baptism is a means of grace. Baptism delivers to us the full forgiveness of our sins. Baptism, as the water is poured over our heads, whether you're two days old or 97 years old, as the water is pulled, poured over your heads, and the pastor says, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I baptize you. You are made a child of God, and you are forgiven. It is as if Jesus is saying right there, I forgive you. You are my child. It's right there that he makes us his very own. That is a means of grace, a delivery way by which God gives us forgiveness. As we think about our lives, we know how true it is that we sin because we are sinners. But we also know how powerful the truth is. We are forgiven by God's grace. Not by our own works that no man may boast by the free gift of forgiveness of sins through Christ Jesus. There are a great many folks out there today who fall into this trap. This idea that there, we somehow have to be involved. That we somehow have to at least open the door a crack for Jesus or somehow let God in. But all of those teachings include us in salvation. They corrupt the words of salvation. The only true way of salvation is knowing that we are saved by Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection, and that alone. The burden is not on us, but He has borne the burden for us. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we know that You created us in the beginning to be perfect, to be wonderful, to walk after You, have your very image we know that because of sin's entry into the world that we no longer live perfect lives that we no longer have free will but our will is bound too often we are bound to fall into sin too often we follow the will of satan allowing our temptations to take hold we thank you that it is not by our power but by your spirit that we are led to your forgiveness, that we are led to the waters of holy baptism, where we are washed and made clean, where you again pronounce those words upon our hearts and lives, I forgive you. No matter how many times a day we come seeking after your forgiveness, we thank you that we receive that forgiveness. Lord, may we never grow weary of seeking your will and your way in our lives, but always know your gracious forgiveness. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.